all of us. I give the word to Tony. Thanks, Ton and David, for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm a historian. I study the Atlantic world and Jewish life in early America, although dare I say it, I, in my own research, I focus more on Ashkenazim, not Sephardim. Um, I teach Drexel at, um, history at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, I became involved in um, the project documenting cemeteries about 10 years ago as a CVE volunteer with Rachel Frankel, um, who I know um, has spoken about the project um, for Sephardic World. Um, and as you said, I'm a, a board member of the um, Jamaican Jewish Cemetery Preservation Fund together with Marina. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, David and Tom for inviting us to present today. I'm speaking to you from Jamaica. And as mentioned, I'm also a member of the JJCPF. Jamaica's Jewish heritage has fascinated me for the last 25 years, as I feel it's a part of Jamaica's history that has been marginalized. And this was the focus of my master's thesis back in 2004, 2005 at the London Metropolitan University. A few years later, I established a heritage walking tour on the north coast of Jamaica. And at the same time, around that time, I met Rachel Frankel, who headed the CV volunteers to Jamaica to record Jewish cemeteries. And for the last 11 years, I've worked alongside these volunteers in the field and at the archival institutions, first with CB and now with JJCPF. So what Tony and I are sharing today is from our personal experience and from that of our colleagues. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with everyone. Um, okay, so um, I just wanna start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Is um, is that we haven't spent a whole lot of time in the archives in Jamaica. Um, we had been returning to Jamaica year after year to work on the cemeteries there. And a few years ago, we decided to explore the archives. So as to establish what sources were available that could complement um, our field work in the cemeteries. So we got a good start over a couple of years, but then um, COVID pre uh, prevented us from continuing. Um, the other point I want to emphasize is that there are significant gaps when it comes to archival sources. Much of the information that pertains to the Jewish community in Jamaica was lost due to fires, earthquakes, and hurricanes. Um, in any case, we are here to share with you what we do know. So this is an overview um, of what we'll talk about. Um, we'll explain what we know about each of these institutions. So um, we have a little bit of experience at the Registrar General's Office, the National Library of Jamaica, the Institute of Jamaica, the National Land Agency, the Jamaica Gleaner Library and Archives, uh, the Jamaica Archives, Synagogue Share Shalom and Heritage Center, the Jewish Monumental Inscriptions, um, and um, the Jamaican Jewish Cemetery uh, preservation fund website which has information as well all right so we'll start with the registrar general's office and the islands record office which are basically one and the same um, they hold the records for birth death marriages wills as well as land deeds the offices were originally located in the center of the old spanish town but they're now on the outskirts on the way to kingston they do offer online services, but some records can only be viewed in person. And the various, there's various fees for whatever, for depending on what you're requesting online. And for to go in person, it's approximately $15 per hour just to be there. I've had minimal experience um, researching at the IRO, but I was able to access some of the 19th century wills, which were fairly revealing, maybe not as interesting as the 18th century um, wills that um, Stanley Mervis's incredible research, you know, revealed to us. And he published that in a book a couple of years ago. I think maybe most of the audience might know that. 
So we'll go at this slide now is just showing you an example of what a will would look like. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see the very last page, but that um, it shows the mandatory, it's a mandatory last page with the seal of the record office of Spanish Town, Jamaica, and the signature of the examiners of the records. So you pay for the, actually the four pages there, even though the last one might not be of any use. So this is the will of Ralph Harris, um, whose first wife was Julia Harris. And he, what he's basically saying in this will, other than leaving his tradition, you know, the traditional belongings, um, stock, whatever, he has left his four children in the care of Lavinia Bravo, who I believe was his sister-in-law. So I think that is it, yeah. So in addition to paying for the time spent, you're paying for the actual documents. So the National Library is located in downtown Kingston. Um, there's a main, uh, main library with books and periodicals, as well as a special collection section that we have visited. Um, they don't charge visitors to come in, but they do charge to make copies. Um, and they scan items and send them via via email as well. So their holdings include newspapers and periodicals, photographs, rare books and 18th century al almanacs, um, surveyor and estate maps. Um, some of the old estate maps are available um, and are of interest to us. Um, we want to go back, for example, to look for an 18th century diagram of land in Lacovia that was conveyed to Abraham Tavares Sr. And he's the last known burial in 1803 at the small Jewish cemetery located in that town. Um, the library also holds other miscellaneous manuscript documents. Um, so visitors can use on-site card catalogs and they also have a published volume um, with listings of their holding. Um, so in general, a person would need to go there and search um, both, both catalogs for names of interest. When I was looking um, for records on a particular person um, several years ago, I found listings in the published book and not in the card catalog. Um, and so I was able to access them. Yeah. And at the moment, it, um, you have to ask, request an appointment via email to access the records. The National Library is actually part of the Institute of Jamaica. The two buildings are side by side in downtown Kingston. The Institute is an agency of the Ministry of Culture. It oversees um, all government museums. Um, we've seen a small collection of artifacts that have been donated and that are held in, um, in the Institute. In particular, we saw a shofar um, and the scroll and pointer that you can see in, in this photo. Um, the museum staff at the time that we were there, the museum staff didn't actually know what the scroll was. A member of our group was able to gently pry it open and, and recognize that it was the scroll of Esther. They also have ceramic items which were commissioned and sold by Rebecca Brandon. So the Brandons were originally called Brandau, um, the family descended from Portuguese Jews that settled in Jamaica. They had a number of shops in Kingston's commercial quarter during the 19th century. So these were items that um, she sold at the time. Um, there are a few other items of interest to, to Jewish history, Jewish heritage that are located in the Fort Charles Museum in Port Royal as well. All right, um, so National Land Agency, uh, although we can find a number of maps at the National Library and the Jamaica Archives, this agency is the, you know, the main agency to research land ownership and maps. So they're response, they have responsibility for land titles, for surveys and mapping, and for land valuations and estate management. Uh, we can access um, land titles and valuations online via their eLand Jamaica service. You actually have to set up an account, put credit on it, and then you are able to download the information that you're searching for. So even if you don't have an address, but you have an idea of where 
in the particular part of Jamaica the land is, you can zoom in, um, click on it, and then, um, it, cause it gives that all that information, um, the folio number. And um, you can also determine property owners surrounding the site that you're looking at. So this image here actually shows um, Falmouth Cemetery on the north coast of the island uh, that one of our members of JJCPS access because we've been on a process of trying to see what cemeteries are still, you know, who owns them? Is it the UCI or is it on private property or what, you know? Um, cadastral maps are useful as they show ownership of land historically. And these maps are housed at the government survey department and you actually have to go in person to see what they have. But unfortunately, the last time I went down um, there, maybe about three years, four years ago, the many of their maps had been damaged um, from a leaking roof. So on this slide coming up, Um, the, I think it's the one, not that one, Tony, that's the Black River one. There's, a, um, it. the one with, with Joseph Harris. I don't know if you have it in there. Mm -mm. Okay. I, yeah, I was going to show, um, land owned by Joseph Harris, what, what I was able to get a photocopy of, um, according, according to Jacob Andrade's compilation of, um, Jamaica's Jewish records. He is buried on this property. So it's of interest to see, you know, a, a, a private property and, uh, you know, you're looking at the archives and does this, can we find these, these tombstones? You know, his, his brother, Ralph, whose will we just displayed, um, was married. Both of them were married to women from the Spanish and Portuguese congregation. Now the diagram in this following slide here shows the location of the 18th century Jewish cemetery in Black River. Black River is located on the south coast of the island. Now, Ainsley Henriquez had mentioned to me, you know, quite long ago that there's a building with the Star of David in the transoms of our, and we did find that building. But what we didn't realize, or at least I didn't realize that there was a Jewish cemetery there as well. And a lady I know that gives walking tours in that town, she's a seventh generation resident of the town. She came across this diagram and she said, oh, Marina, by the way, I found this diagram. And she, there it is, Jews burial ground. I think the image on the right shows it more clearly. And so we, that was in 2013 and we went looking for it in 2014 and we did find it. And it, it was four, four tombstones stacked on top of um, each other. Then we excavated another one and a little tiny plaque from a, a fifth one. So we were actually excited to discover this site and, you know, this is all now documented. So we have still quite a more to uncover. Um, Jamaica Gleaner Library and Archives. This is another inf um, institution with wealth of information. It was originally called the Daily Gleaner and it's the oldest newspaper publication in Jamaica still operating and it was founded by the, the court of our brothers who are Jamaican Jews. The archives are available for a fee online or by physically visiting their library, which you do have to make an appointment. The kind of information you'll find will include obituaries, um, birth and marriage announcements, um, business advertisements, arrival and departures of citizens to and from the island, photographs and many other items of interest. We haven't personally used it, but a colleague has. Um, she's discovered that many of the weekend editions were not scanned. They were overlooked for some reason. And they are aware of this. And also she has found that the quality is not that great. But when she visited the British Library in person a few years ago, she was able to access them, um, which they have on microfilm in their reading room. Uh, so there's still quite a bit to be digitized. And that's it for the Jamaica Gleaner. Um, now we come to the archives, which is the archival institution we are most familiar with. And it's located in the old city of Spanish town, um, right next to the square. It's, 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 it's quite nice being there when we take a break. 
and we go outside and eat. It's it's just a lovely atmosphere. And it's not far from one of the um, former burial grounds. So there's no fee to access records, but there is to take photos and request scans. Um, so they do have quite a um, wide range of records. I will talk about um, specifically just on births and marriages for the KKSA. Um, and these are the synagogue records and, and how the um, archives list them in their index. So I'm just gonna go through this um, section 1809 to 1907. Just a few things that, um, examples of things that jumped out at me that I found interesting. So the next slide, um, two slides just shows what the registers look like. This is for the English and German um, synagogue. And the next one is what the, um, for the Spanish and Portuguese. So here for the Spanish and Portuguese are here are the things that stood out for me. For births, there were approximately 2,287 births over a 93 year period. The first was recorded on January 15, 1809, and the last on November 23, 1902. Illegitimate children were recorded, and if these illegitimate children were boys, the circumcision was also recorded. Uh, what was in very interesting was the notation of the birth of a mamzer, <laughs> if I pronounce that correctly, which is generally speaking, a child is born from certain forbidden relationships. Um, marriages, a total of 518 marriages were recorded over a 92 year period. The first on January 14, 1809, and the last on January 9, 1901. Wednesday seemed to have been a very popular day to get married on, and I was trying to figure out why that might have been. When I first went to live in Kingston a number of years ago, I no longer live there because I'm on the North Coast. Um, they had this um, tradition of closing businesses downtown early on a Wednesday and uptown businesses were closed early on a Thursday. So I'm wondering if this kind of got transferred from the 19th century to the 20th century. So I, I found that pretty interesting. Maybe that's a reason why Wednesday was popular. Um, we also see mention when Mam Zerim got married as they only could marry each other. So on Wednesday, December 7th, 1831, it says both in the comments, it says both Mam, Mam Zerim married by Isaac Lopez. So the next slide now shows a book, a page from the book of uh, Ketuba. Did I pronounce that correctly? So. Thank you. Um, based on notes from one of our colleagues, Sam um, Petukowski, this ketubot contains 30 marriage certificates, English on the left, Amharic on the right, and in most cases, the Aramaic is in the handwriting of the officiant. Uh, what Sam found interesting was the variations of describing Jamaica's location. So we have, for instance, Jamaica described as Jamaica of India in the sea of the West. Then we have Jamaica in the sea of the West Indies and also on the island of Jamaica of India West of the water. So that, uh, that is pretty interesting. The final uh, slide that I will share in this section um, is just a table I created uh, breaking down the number of births and marriages over 11 year period from 1809 to 1819. So births seem to be stable at an average of 36 per year. Um, there's a spike in marriages in 1812 for some reason, um, a high of 17. The previous year was five marriages and the next was um, nine. So it's another tidbit to delve further into. Tony, over to you. Um, so we've spent most of the, the times, certainly the opportunities we've had to actually spend days in the archive, it, it, it has been at the Jamaica archives. Um, the sources that Marina described are the obvious sources if you're doing research on Jewish families in Jamaica, but there are a whole lot of other records that have plenty of hints and information, but one needs to do a little bit more digging. Um, uh, so, 
some of the avenues that we've pursued are um, the naturalization patents, patents of land grants. Um, they have those from 1661 to 1940. Plats, which are drawings of lands granted, also from 1661 to 1755. They have inventories from 1661 to 1881. Tax tolls, manumission of slaves from 1747 to 1838. There are also almanacs, handbooks, and directories in their collection. So we've had the opportunity to look at some of these items, and I'm going to show you some examples of what we've seen. Um, so when we were going to the archives, we were trying to establish what sources they might have that are useful for conducting research on the island's Jews. So we haven't yet, or, you know, kind of in the times that we were there, we hadn't yet worked out a system of recording exactly what they had. We were more interested in taking a look at some of these sources and, and seeing if we could extract information that was useful. Um, so we hope in another couple of years, if COVID permits, we'll be able to get back in there and then really assess, you know, how many volumes there are, you know, in each uh, category, for example. So this is a picture from an actual uh, one of the, the, the books. Um, as Marina, I think Marina said that um, it's, it's free to go into the Jamaica archives, but quite pricey to make copies. Um, some of the, the um, libraries, certainly in the United States, you can pay a minimal fee to be able to take digital photographs. Um, they don't allow that. I think that they, um, uh, the money that they collect from making copies helps them to keep the archive going. Um, so we do, I do not have um, a whole lot of um, photos of the sources. So this is one of, of a few that I have. In other cases, I have transcriptions that I will show you. So um, this uh, is from the poll tax records. And the archives have dozens and dozens of books for different parts of the island uh, and for different years. So I asked for a random one. I asked for the, the Kingston um, poll tax for the East Division, and this was the year 1795. And so you can see all the names um, and across um, the top, there are categories like um, who the tenant is, who the landlord is. Um, I'll show you a closer up of my own transcriptions um, in a few minutes. But if you look at this page, you've just got a series of names. So if you're looking for information on Jews in Jamaica, of course, then you really have to sit with the books and find the names. Um, the next slides that I'm going to show you are the transcriptions that basically I just pulled out the names that were of interest and lined them up um, as I was making notes. So this data comes from my own transcription from the 1792 Kingston poll tax for the West Division. So, um, you know, I, I kind of went through page by page for several pages looking for names. And so this is what it looks like. But of course, if you go to the archives, there'll be you know, a whole lot of other names in between. But again, so the categories are um, tenants at the top, landlords, rents, slaves, which is an uncomfortable detail that one is forced to confront in the, in the archives, um, cattle, wheels, stock and trade, and um, the... Uh, the amount that was was paid. Um, whoops. I'm moving things around on my screen so I can get to it and now it's not cooperating. There we go. Um, okay, this came um, from the same book again, just to show you how many you know names do come up because it was it was just a few pages that I managed to um, pull these names from. So in a lot of cases, if um, there were Jewish tenants, they often rented from landlords, which is this column, um, who were also Jewish. This is um, from the index of patents. Um, right. Um, So to find the patent, 
um, in the index. So again, several volumes. Um, this came from volume two. And again, we looked for um, the names that jumped out of us that seemed to be Jewish names. If you're doing research in the archives, the index gives you a sense of where to go, which books to go to, to, to find the actual documents. So in this case, uh, Moses Andrade's patent of, of um, naturalization will be in folio six. Um, but again, a lot of um, uh, uh, sources that pertain. The next two slides, again, are selective transcriptions from the taxation rolls. Um, in this case, um, they came out of um, books that were for the years 1807 to 1822 um, for St. Catherine. Again, um, I recorded only the names were of interest. Again, they record um, slaves, stock, wheels, rent, trade, and the amount that was paid. So these figures, you know, kind of just looking at these books um, just seem to be figures, but it tells you, you know, something about the people whose names are recorded there in terms of um, their, their socioeconomic um, level at the very least. Um, Again, from the same book, some other information that was recorded there. Um, uh, in this case, um, uh, the amount um, they had to pay per acre. This was Adolphus and Spire, um, Mrs. De Campos. And interestingly, there are a lot of notations of women um, who are paying the taxes. Um, this, again, transcriptions that I tried to um, recreate exactly as I saw it in the box. These were from the government records. Um, they were declarations of land held, in this case, um, 1784 to 1785. But as you can see, this was volume number 26. So again, you know, lots and lots of books that one would have to pour over to get the information. I'm sorry, I made that progress. Whoop, going the wrong way. Um, so in this case, it was land belonging to Moses Lopez Barrios, um, and it gives you an indication of um, the size of the property that he owned. Likewise, um, here's two more notations, in this case, um, for Ralph Pereira da Costa, um, and um, it held by the estate of Moses Nunez Henriquez in the possession of Batsheba Henriquez. Um, so it's not only the size of the land, but, but other information about the families um, that one can extract from these records. They also have other sources that can be useful. In this case, manumission records. Again, you would have to sit with a book and pour over it. Um, but in this case, it was a record that Solomon de Costa Gomez um, manumitted um, his mulatto slave, George. Um, another way to find information at the Jamaica archives is through their database catalog. So when we visited, I sat at their computer for a little while, just plugging in names as keywords to see what the computer would, uh, you know, kind of would, would yield if I put those names in. So I had used names that were of relevance to people in our um, CVE group. Um, so in this case, De Leon, and, and so the notations that I have here are exactly, you know, as I saw them on the computer, the kinds of documents they have um, with any, anyone with the name De Leon um, in their collections. Likewise, um, for the name Lindo, um, it um, gave several um, documents that are in the collection. Um, I had done the same um, for my own research on um, Ashkenazim. Um, and so the, I actually went in to, to find, uh, to, to see what the documents actually were. So in this case, I found this um, indenture that pertained to the sale of land. So quite a range of documents um, of interest um, if you're willing to go there and put in the time. Okay, 
Um, another source of information is at the synagogue Share Shalom and the Heritage Center. So this building is a picture of the synagogue. Um, it's an early 20th century building located in downtown Kingston. Um, the Heritage Center was established in around 2006, which was a year after the community celebrated it, um, 350 years of continuous presence in Jamaica. Um, the synagogue has a small archives. They hold um, more recent burial records, um, but they also hold copies of um, the, the um, congregational records that were then placed later placed in Jamaica archives that Marina spoke about before. So there are copies at um, at the synagogue and in their possession um, where one could. Um, do some research. Here's what those look like, though. Here on the left, so they, they, they created mimeographed copies of the books in the 1960s, so a little bit harder to re read because of the, the reversal of the black and white. And on the right is actually the, the letter um, uh, um, uh, that was sent to the, the congregation when the Jamaica archives took possession of those books. All right, so now we go to the Jewish monumental ins inscriptions. And most of the work that we've actually done is as a group through CV and JJCPF. And it's been really meaningful and exciting, you know, when we've done this field work. Um, you know, we've gone to several cemeteries throughout the island and documentary evidence has, you know, pushed us, pushed us in the direction of some of these places and um, if they weren't known beforehand. And the tombstones themselves, you know, ha have provided significant information for the archives. As far as we can tell, um, particularly by using Jacob Andrade's book on um, Jamaica's Jewish history, there were at one point 26 burial grounds and this included communal as well as private and there may be more private ones that we're unaware of um, and yet to be discovered. Uh, some of these cemeteries are lost forever for instance in Port Marie on the north coast um, they rerouted a river through the Jewish cemetery so we do have some of the names that were buried there but um, one grave site remains and we hope one day to have some sort of um, storyboard indicating who was buried there as far as we know. Um, some are now, some communal um, sites, uh, cemeteries are now in private, located on private land, and then others are in total disrepair. Now, most of the field work um, that we've done has been informed by Barnett and Wright's publication on Jewish tombstone inscriptions but they've only given partial inventories of the sites they visited. Um, sometimes markers were missed altogether as they just weren't visible. So in this slide, coming up, this is of Savannah Lamar that I believe we visited in 2013. So the bottom left-hand corner, that photo there is just showing the backyard of this lady. And it's apparent that this is just a small section of what could have been a fairly sizable cemetery because we found a fragment of a tombstone in another backyard behind. Um, and you see that, that um, there's a tombstone right there on the bottom left-hand corner, a photograph that you can see that there's part of a tombstone there. But the photo above it now just shows a corner of a piece of marble. So it kind of looked like just a piece of marble. And but we decided, we looked at it more closely and said, wow, this is something that needs to be excavated. So we excavated it and um, it belonged to Jacob um, Lopez Henriquez. And it probably just wasn't seen before. Um, so we uncovered it, um, we recorded the information and we, covered it back up as to leave it as we found it. So this information now is added to archival documentation of the remains of this particular cemetery. So, we're, you know, our, our work on the cemeteries is exhaustive and 
this is why JJCPF is working on a project that will eventually have all this information available online. So just a couple of pictures from um, a couple of other uh, cemeteries. Again, this is Orange Street, um, a fragment of one of the headstones um, that now lays on the ground. As you can see from the picture on the right, some of the graves are in disrepair, others are intact, but it's really incredibly important information that we are trying to um, save. Um, as we take our inventories of the, the cemeteries. So um, here and for, is... Yeah, for instance, Tony, just to point out, Lavinia Bravo, I just located this fragment um, two weeks ago, and it's the same Lavinia Bravo mentioned in the will that we presented earlier. Um, likewise with Hunts Bay, which is the oldest cemetery on the island, and it's a Jewish cemetery, there are graves dating back to um, the 1690s. Um, again, many of them intact, many of them in disrepair, and each time we've gone back, we've seen um, additional damage to them. This, um, the picture on the left, of course, is always exciting because it has that skull and crossbones that inspired um, the book on Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Um, but so through our, um, the years that we keep going back to the cemeteries and recording the information, this has been the primary thing that we've been doing. And we're trying to turn the information from the, um, from the cemeteries into documentary, um, archival sources. Um, we recording, um, the inscriptions on the headstones We're we're taking measurements. We are, um, uh, recording coordinate, co coordinates for each of them. And we are slowly but surely working very hard at making that um, available to the public. I think this group has, has seen this, but again, given that we're talking about information that's available through archives, I will just show you um, our website. And if you click on the projects tab and the cemetery database, for now, we have Hunts Bay and Lakovia. Um, the information is complete. Everything that we know um, is available to search on our website. And to do that, um, you go in and you can click on search records. You can either enter, enter a name um, into the box or you can click on um, a grave and information comes up. In this case, it's a grave and there is no longer any information of who was buried there, but in other cases, there is information. Um, there are also on our website uh, photos of each of the headstones um, and that, so that's available for people to, to do that research. And I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was that was um, that was quite brilliant. Can I first of all um, welcome um, our, our past speakers on on Jamaica who've joined us? That's uh, Ainsley Henriquez, uh, Stephen Porter, and, and Rachel Frankel. And um, we were we were discussing before the meeting that that Jamaica is is sort of this this black hole in in uh, Western Sephardic history. So um, the work that uh, sort of Tony Marina and uh, colleagues are doing is is invaluable. Um, my my first question is just a practical question. That every time I try to contact the general register office, um, they're not very good at replying. Is is there any way of um, of uh, of, of uh, encouraging them or getting information faster? Well, we, we haven't had that experience of trying to reach them. Um, maybe Ainsley could give advice, but I am thinking that maybe Stan Mervis might be the best person to, he seems to have had a great relationship for his book and his research. Yeah, he, he, he also actually uh, spoke to us before and his, uh, his talk can be found on the, uh, the right. YouTube um, channel. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that there are no plans to be digitizing all of these archives you are um, discussing, or not yet. Harris? The, the, the various records that you were showing us, are, are there any plans or just not, not the funds? 
When, well, first of all, when we started looking for this, we were, we were just trying to establish what's out there. We have not yet spoken to anyone from the archives. There's a question of provenance, and I, we certainly um, don't have the right to just digitize them. I, Marina, you can probably speak more directly to this. I'm not sure that they have yeah, the funding um, when, to Yeah, when we met with the Jamaica Archives, just to finding out you know, where their headspace is at and how they're working out, they do have the machine, the scanner, that can do very good work. Um, but it's that they have so many requests. They're short-staffed, mm -hmm. and they have so many requests for... Um, for for documents to be um, scanned. And they actually said, our group, our, C our now JJ CPF group, are the only people that basically come in and ask for Jewish records. So it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how, what kind of relationship we can, I, I hope to once they're reopened, they may be reopened to the public now, that we can have maybe further dialogue of how that can happen. Um, the National Library of Jamaica, I know they acquired a new scanner maybe a year and a half ago. So um, I don't know what their pos position is with staff and how they look about things like that. I mean, what we would need to determine is how many records are there, you know, that refer to Jews that we could, you know, arrange to get scanned or digitized. No, I, I, I was also thinking just more generally about the sort of uh, the cadastral records, the poll tax records, the manumissions and, and so forth, the more general right. records. Right. Those, yeah, those are, you know, those are in, that's the Jamaica archives there. So really it's a matter of their shorter staff and what is the priority of, you know, what the requests they have and guided by uh, the, the government archivist. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tom, Tom, do we have any um, questions here? Um, yes, David Simon and Adrian Jeanette are interested in uh, Daniel Moses Cohenda Azevedo. He left England in 1803 to Kingston. And he was a Khazan of Bevis Marks before. And it's uh, quite probable that he also was a Hassan in Bevis Marx. Have you come across that name? Cohen is, it's Daniel Cohen. What man? Just could you give the full name again? Daniel Moses Cohen de Azevedo. I can't say that I have. Tony, have you? No, it's not familiar. I mean, long term, we would love to be able to collect as many, draw as many connections as possible uh, from the names on the on the graves and and um, collate any information that we find on them. But we're we're a tiny group with with no funding. So, but that if you send, yeah, but if you send us the info, like whoever's asking these questions on particular persons, Tan and David, if you could just um, send it, you know, yeah. email it to me then I, on my next visit, you know, I can certainly, you know, look it up and see what information I can find. Okay. Um, Bernard, you've got your hand up if you want to unmute. Thanks. Um, thank you both for the fantastic work that you're doing, first of all. I've got two very specific questions and a kind of comment suggestion. First, very simple question, but you referred two or three times to wheels. And I didn't know what the reference to wheels um, actually meant. So perhaps you could explain that. Second question is about manumission. Um, and um, in research that I've been doing and meetings that I've been to online about manumission, there seems to be... Um, quite a lot of specific manumission of women slaves so that they could marry um, the people who were manumitting them. Um, and I wondered whether that was a phenomenon that you had in Jamaica. And I'll throw in the comment, which is that um, over the last few months, I've been spending time in the London 
metropolitan archives and various other archives in London, going through papers that relate to my mother, none of which have been digitized. And I've basically agreed with most of the places that I'm going that I will photograph stuff and index it and let them have photographs as um, digital images with indexing um, simply because I'm doing it for my own information and I might as well share it. You know, there's no money for this. Um, they don't have a budget. I don't have a budget, but it's work that I'm doing. So I might as well share it. So it's to encourage anybody who is doing anything like that to share their work, to offer it to archives. One of the archives that I've been to didn't want it because they've said when they get round to digitizing, they will devise their own system and they don't want stuff that won't fit in with the future system, which they've got no idea when it's going to be. But I throw that in as a, a suggestion. So the wheels question, um, I am pretty sure um, means carriages of different kinds. So there would have been two wheel carriages and four wheel carriages, and it was an indication of someone's wealth. Thanks. Um, in terms of manumissions, I will let Marina and anyone else who is knowledgeable on this um, subject chime in, but just knowing what we know from around the Atlantic world, there was offspring um, of slave owners and their female slaves. Um, there were instances of marriages or, or common law marriages. Um, what I have seen is that, uh, say, uh, you know, a land or a, a property owner, uh, um, a planter, it, he had children by his slave women, and then he gets married to, has a legitimate marriage to a, a white woman. Uh, he tended to some because it's happened in my family where they've freed the the women and their children by the, these women on their date of marriage. Um, I've seen at the Jamaica archives where I'm pretty sure it's been some Jewish men freeing their presumed children. They were put presumed, I guess, but um, most likely it were it was their child, you know, when they freed them. Okay, can That's I just add I'm... this? What, what I was coming across was because there was a shortage of eligible Jewish women, um, they were manumitting female slaves, right. um, having them convert and then marrying them rather than regularizing irregular situations. And I wondered whether you'd come across that phenomenon haven't come across it yet, but I'm sure after emancipation that there was a lot more unions that were acceptable, um, mm -hmm. probably with persons not living in the main areas where you would be going to synagogue, you know, but in the country areas. I'm sure a lot more of that may have happened after slavery was abolished in officially in 1838. Thank you. It'd be interesting for us, you know, but that's an interesting you know, observation that you've seen that we could look out for as well. Yes, was marrying the only reason to free slaves? No, I just think they felt, and, and I think something is mentioned in, in Stan's book also about, you know, freeing maybe children or whatever. But I mean, it's just, I, I don't think it was just for marrying. I think just that they wanted their child you know maybe to inherit or to be recognized or as you know as their legal child i don't know um uh, ali ali has his hand up do you want to speak yeah hi uh this is about um one of the documents that you showed actually names um uh, one of my wife's ancestors solomon gomez de costa who manumitted uh a slave named George in 1805. And um, I think it's quite possible that this might have been one of his children because um, the research that I've done shows that Solomon had at least five children by three different women. 
purposely uh, described as mulatto or uh, mesti and so forth. So it, this is this is not a name I've come across, George, but uh, it, you know it, it, it certainly fits his um, it fits his his modus operandi, if you like. And uh, eight, eight of, 1805 is roughly when he went back to England to to marry uh, and married a fairly um, high upper class kind of uh, Ashkenazi. So it's very interesting that uh, that, that the name should come up, and I'd, I'd I'd be interested to have a look at that in more detail. And it may be it, it, that name might be even rec recorded. The birth of that child, you know, yeah. may be recorded in the registers. If it's so long as because we the you know we have the registers. Um, the the English and German start at 1799, and the ones we have from the um, um, Sephardic and uh, the Spanish and Portuguese start 1809. So I don't, yeah, but it might be recorded somewhere. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Gahan asks, were slave holdings taxed in Jamaica? Say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, were slave holdings taxed in America? Were they subject to- uh, Oh, taxes, taxes. yes, yeah, yeah. Because those tax polls, that was the reason for listing the number of slaves. Again, mm -hmm. it was um, an indication of wealth. And yes, people were, were taxed according to the number of slaves that they had. So, so Tony, it's Bruce Dayhan, hi. Um, would that mean that by manumitting, you reduce your taxes? <laughs> As the son of a Jewish accountant, I just asked in passing. I think we have to examine something. We have to examine the fact that most of the people who came originally after the capture of Jamaica by the English were people fleeing anti-Semitism. They came primarily as males, seeking a new world, a new life. And of course, there were not very many women that came with them. So the idea that uh, when men and uh, Jewish men integrated with a lot of the subsequent um, people who were dragged here or shoved here. The Irish were brought here as slaves, and then there was a large continuum uh, uh, of, of an Africans who were brought as slaves. So the mix in Jamaica is incredible. There is an estimated hundreds of thousands, possibly three to four hundred thousand Jamaicans with Jewish ancestry, and they're not Jews, not practicing Jews. But it doesn't recognize. It recognizes also part of what you are discussing, and the idea also of how the whole thing worked was also deeply re 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 um, what's the word? research by Eli Faber. Eli did a tremendous amount of work and would be a, his work would be true, significant import to, to Tony and, uh, and, 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 and Marina um, because it was done, what, 10 years ago or more. Now Eli, unfortunately, has passed on. So his work on the slavery was recognized and was, and in fact, commissioned by the by the American Jewish community. So it's all part of parcel of what we need to gather, not just looking at it today from the beginning as what you think it's the beginning. That work was done previously. As a, other aspect, aspect of this work, of course, which I want to share with you, that I happen to have a significant genealogical record of Jamaican Jews, not of Jews only, but of people who have had Jewish ancestry. So this is again telling, this tells us part of the story that we find Levy's and Cohen's and, and, and Henriquez's and all kinds of people who are not practicing Jews and are not even looking white if you wish ethnicity to be an issue. But ethnicity is not an issue for us anymore and hasn't been for a large number of years. The fact is that there are so many Cohen's and Levy's and others who are not practicing as Jews is simply because the, the tradition of the time was not to, 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 to convert significantly people who are um, not Jewish and, and also the fact that we are in competition with the Christian movements. So these are really interesting stories. I have a story of my my my, grand, my, my, my late wife's godmother who was a Miss Levy. And that's a whole nother story. She went to synagogue with her father, but she her mother was Catholic. And she eventually, when she died, I had to bury her in the Catholic, Jewish Catholic Church. But she was of, originally of a Jewish background. So this is all part of the mix that Jamaica has, which is not easily justified and, and me measured by what we find in much of the rest of the world. It's a quite fascinating experience. 
And I'm very happy that what both Marina and Tony have been doing because they've been bringing out even in more detail what Stan and I started from the days when Stan first turned up in Jamaica, uh, supposedly as a, as, a de as a surrogate for my, my efforts in one sense, but at the same time created a tremendous amount of research and his book on the uh, his book on 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 the, on the pro probated wills of the 18th century Jews is a significant importance because it tells so much of the story that I'm now trying to repeat. So good luck, and I keep saying to everybody, let's continue because this is a, as Con has indicated, we start in the program. This is an incredibly unique Irish view. I use you use the word black hole. I say it is a life hole. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's some um, some questions on um, YouTube. There was quite a lively conversation going on about what what colour Sephardim are, which is a little odd. Um, Giovanni asks. Um, he's researching the Rodriguez and Alvaranga uh, families, and is just curious if if those families have uh, have turned up. It's probably quite a few Rodriguez families. Um, and Henning is interested in Henrique Lewis, aka Henry Lewis, and wife Isabel. Um, uh, duh, duh, duh. Is, is, is there a Lewis family associated with the um, Sephardic community? Lewis, L E W I S or L O U I S? Lewis, L, -L E W I S. I, I'm not familiar with any, name, any family names of Jewish ancestry at the moment in that, except yeah. for one person who is a recent immigrant from England and carries that Jewish, good English Jewish name, Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> we are Sephardim, <laughs> I, yeah. I claim. But on the other hand, of course, many of us are what I now consider to be cafe con leche. We have a lot of Ashkenazi uh, bloodlines in our systems. And I will admit that I have a grandmother who came from the UK. Thank you. Um, Tom, Tom, do we have any more uh, questions or statements? Yes. Uh, are there professional uh, genealogists who are uh, willing to do some work in the Jamaican archives for a fee? Is there a list of names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, etc.? There, there are a few people, and as Ainsley says, he, you know, he has um, quite a um, bit of resources there as well. Um, it is something I am delving into more and looking at becoming accredited. But I've been asked over the last few times, many, you know, I've been doing it as a favor to a lot of people. So I'm going to get more involved with it and be. Um, it's what I will be doing as my new career. So, but there are other people out there that are well known, more a little more experienced than me. But I have I've been able to gain a lot of information just by you know being out in the field, going to the archives. But Ainsley could probably give you. I think there's Diane. Is it Frankson Golden Ainsley, or is it Golden Frankson? Frankson, oh, she's a, she's a, an amazing amount of. Uh genealogical yeah. work, but then I'm looking at Stephen Porter. So good morning, Stephen, or good afternoon, Stephen. He's also another amazing genealogist. And yes. I, to his right, it's David Silvera. And if you think this, you don't want to know where the Silveras come from, ask David. He knows where everyone came from. Where he ended up, where they ended up is another story. But then most of them are not Jewish today. Thank you. Um, and there's Catherine, a, Catherine, Catherine, you have your, your hand up. If you want to ask a question. No. Maybe not, maybe that was a mistake. I, I, I saw a couple of questions, or somebody was asking questions before about newspapers. Um, not sure where they, where they are. I mean, are, are there other historic newspapers that that survive from from Jamaica. I'm wondering, especially about sort of trade 
trade newspapers. I mean, a lot of newspapers in England used to report when um, when uh, ships uh, arrived and uh, you know who owned them and stuff like that. You see a lot of that on Jamaica Family Search website. Um, what they've transcribed. There are various publications, some were um, local to certain towns, but they you will see them give a list of like arrivals, departures, um, you know, this is who arrived on the island, um, deaths, um, marriages, commissions, all sorts of things that were interesting, you know, interesting to society at that time. You know, there's the Colombian magazine and there's um, the almanacs, there's there's a but that that website gives you quite a big list. I think the point that Mar uh, Marina is making is also quite important because a lot of Jamaican Jews migrated to the opportunities that were created in the United States during the 18th and 19th centuries after slavery as well. And there's also uh, Cartagena was a major center for Jewish uh, my work, economic activity uh, uh, between Jamaica and, 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 and Colombia. So, and of course, interestingly, there weren't, there didn't seem to be many relationships with Curacao, which is the old, this Jewish center and literally in the new world. Barbados, to a certain extent, limited extent, but the Barbados community died out, of course, in the, 19, in the 1920s. It's now back on track, thank goodness. Um, so, of course, there was nobody, none of us here with any real link to the Spanish countries, with the exception of Panama. So you have to be able to trace sometimes, not just the families only in Jamaica, but also to where they migrated to and who and what happens to them after that. And I will claim to tell you that the most important rabbi in North America at Cherry Israel was Henry Pereira Mendez from the Mendez, Pereira Mendez family of Montego Bay. So I'm really pushing that issue. Who he was? Who he was? My wife said I must tell you who he was. His, his aunt was my great great grandmother. <laughs> okay, uh, on um, on YouTube, um, we're asked to go back to Giovanni's question. Um, Rachel uh, Alvaranga married uh, Benjamin Rodriguez. Uh, on uh, February the 24th, 1820 in Kingston. Um, and there's, there's some, apparently there's a DNA connection to the uh, Silvera um, family. Um, have, have either of these names, uh, Rachel Al Alvarenga or, or, or Benjamin Rodriguez from the early 19th century so appeared anywhere? Well, I've seen I've seen those name maybe not the full name, but I've seen those family names. Yeah, um, it's it's hard to re unless you're specifically researching them. It's actually hard, you know, difficult to recall those specific things. But um, you know, and it's it's just making a notation, and if we come across more information, we can share it. I mean, I, d I don't know where the questioner is. I mean, uh, probably not in Jamaica. I mean, what's what's the solution? Just to 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 get in touch with yourself and. I think uh, Rachel put my um, email address in the chat. Rachel Franco put my email address in the chat. For okay, we, we won't put it on YouTube, but if anyone on YouTube yeah. wants to get in touch, then just uh, send us a message and we can forward it. Uh, Ra Rachel, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a recollection of there being minute books from the fraternal orders, the Jewish fraternal orders. One was called the Friendly Society, and then there was another one. But Marina, I can't remember where where those things were. Do you do you know about that? They were kind of interesting. I remember one of our volunteers found some interesting things about his family in there. Not the not the book on that Andrade did beforehand. No, not no, that. no, no. They were these talking minutes. about when you say fraternal society, you're not talking about like the lodge or Freemasonry. That's what I'm talking about. There was oh, yeah. there was. Oh, I think I, I can. Oh, add I it can was at it. the National Library. That's who okay. had it. The National Library. Yeah, they were, were interesting. Jews were in the forefront of the Masonic movement in Jamaica from the meet from the. If I'm correct, from the early eight, mid 18th century. Okay, so you know you're looking at a long history 
of Jews involved in the Masonic lodges and records that are in the Masonic lodges and in the Masonic collection of records and minute books. We can have probably access to eventually to be able to look at who did what in in the in the role of being Masons. Okay, and um, yes, yes, and the Masons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I now remember sitting in the National Library looking at that book. And there's this book here too, Rachel, on Montego Bay and the Friendly Lodge. And when you ah. look on family, um, Jamaica family search, um, they give you a list of many of the members from the early 1800s who just happened to be Jewish. I'd say 90% seem to have been right. Jewish. So this book actually is written by, um, you know, a member, um, George Palmer. So, and he actually had some of the original records. So, I've been trying to meet with him. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but years ago, I was trying to meet with him to find out more information. Thank you. Over our former colleague, Heidi Kaufman, who was doing a lot of work on the Polacks, because the Polack brothers, three of them, were all members of the Friendly Lodge. So, and were Jews. Polack and were Jews, yeah. yeah. And I'd like to recognize Rachel because without Rachel, I think we wouldn't be sitting here today. So the work that Rachel and the CV really introduced as a friend uh, and, and, and more than a friend of mine and, and Jamaican Jews. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Ainsley. Azahu uh, Baruch. Um, just, just, just to add, actually, um, a couple of months ago, I went into the... Um, not sure what it's called. I think the Freemason Central Hall in 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 central London near, near Covent Garden, and was uh, speaking to the archivist who um, says they have records from you know all over the uh, all over the world, and hopefully we can have him come and speak in in mm. in a few months because that would be um, useful. Um, I know there are more questions on um, or comments on YouTube, but Ton, shall we? Shall we close now? We've sort of gone okay. over an hour. Yes. Thank you to uh, Tony and Marina, who gave us a very lively uh, experience of all the sources that are there for Jamaica. Uh, and there are a lot more that we haven't discussed yet. I think of uh, colonial archives in England, uh, the archives of Bevis Marx in London and uh, others that may have information about Jamaican Jews. Um, uh, I would like to remind you all to take uh, um, a regular look at the database on the website of the Jewish Jamaican, uh, no, the Jamaican Jewish Cemeteries Preservation Fund. It's online and there will be more and more data added in the future. Uh, all, I wish to thank our patrons who make all of this possible. And I want to thank our viewers on YouTube. Uh, next week, we will have uh, Mark Ponte, who will talk about Amsterdam and the subject that has been mentioned briefly here, uh, slavery. Yeah. And I hope to see you all next week. Again, thank you, Tony and Marina. Thank you, Tony. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs>